Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It is fantastic to see so many of you along here today um, and welcoming and introducing yourselves in the chat. Please do go ahead and let us know who is in the virtual room. So we're delighted to be here today for our session on the Big Fair Trade CPD, which will give you lots of resources and tips to bring fair trade and climate change into your classroom. Now, as you're maybe aware, we are in the middle of fair trade fortnight at the moment, which is two weeks that happen every year at the end of February and beginning of March, where schools, universities, colleges, businesses, community organisations all across the country come together to learn about the people who grow our food and drinks, who mine our gold and to grow the cotton in our clothes. And these are people that are very often exploited and underpaid. Now, there's a different learning focus of Fair Trade Fortnite every year. And this year is all about fair trade and climate change. So the impact that climate change is having on farmers around the world and how those two things are connected and how we can explore the issues with learners. So I'm delighted to be joined by lots of really interesting speakers today. And we've got them up on screen here to help us to explore some of these issues. Um, you can see their logos up on screen here. So we're joined today by Sally and Josh from the One World Centre, which is a development education centre which promotes global justice and equality through education by supporting teachers, schools and community groups to engage in global citizenship. So they're going to come with lots of practical hints and tips for you today as well. We've got JTC, JTS, sorry, and we've got Tracy Mitchell along from JTS today. And they're a fair trade enterprise set up to facilitate the import and distribution of fairly traded food products to the UK. And they do some fantastic work with schools. We're gonna learn about one of their fair trade challenges that they can offer you. Well, we're also joined by the Scottish Fair Trade Forum who are an organisation who contribute to building a just, equitable and sustainable world by supporting Scotland to remain a vibrant fair trade nation and working to embed the principles of fair trade in all aspects of Scottish society. Um, Scottish Fair Trade Forum are with us today and we've also got um, Fair Trade Wales who do um, similar fantastic work to uh, the Scottish Fair Trade Forum in Wales. So we'll learn a bit about them. And last but not least, we have Andy Ashcroft joining from Cool Schools who are suppliers of ethical and sustainable school uniforms and fairness, quality and affordability are the school schools mantra. So we've got loads of um, loads of ways for you to get involved at your school with fair trade and we'll be passing on to um, meet those speakers in a moment. But first of all, just to cover off what we're going to cover today. So in today's session, you will hopefully deepen your own understanding of fair trade and how farmers are affected by climate change. Because to bring these issues into the classroom, it's good to ha have a good understanding of these yourselves. So hopefully we'll be able to support you with that today. The second thing is we're going to learn more about how fair trade connects to national curriculums across the UK. We won't spend too uh, long on this, but we'll just highlight some of the links um, because it's applicable and relevant to all of the national curriculums. And then hopefully you'll be equipped by the end of the session with lots of educational activities from the variety of organisations that I've gone through here. And finally, have a good understanding of how to bring fair trade and climate change into your own classroom. So that's what we're going to cover today. And we've got these fantastic organisations along to help us do that. And I realised that um, I missed out the last one in my initial introduction, which is, of course, the Fair Trade Foundation. And um, my name is Claire Arnott, and I am the Senior Education 
uh, campaigns officer in the Fair Trade Schools team. So I'll also be sharing a little bit about our work and what we offer and how we can support schools bring fair trade and climate change to life in your lessons. So just to start off, to get us in the headspace of learning a bit about fair trade and different types of products, that we'd start ju just with a two minute quiz. So these are all resources you can find on the Fair Trade Schools website. So what are these? These are all fair trade food or drinks that you might see in your local supermarket, but what are they? So if you just want to have a guess in the chat, obviously putting the number that you're guessing for and then the product and we'll see if between us how many have we got we've got 53 on the call so I'm hoping that between us we will get all six so we've got some guesses for one three and five yep yeah. I'll just give you about 60 seconds to have a look at some of these products and consider um what are these We're doing pretty well so far. I think number six has not been uh, guessed yet. Yeah, fantastic. I think between us, we've managed to get all six. So answers on screen, we have number one is a cashew nut. This is a cashew apple. And on the bottom, the nut grows from the base of this. Now, if you think when you're buying a bag of cashew nuts at the supermarket, um, and each of them comes from this beautiful cashew apple, that the amount of work and care that goes into bringing that bag um, to the supermarket and to our cupboards is quite incredible. Number two is, of course, tea. Number three is cocoa, of course, the product that we know and love that goes into chocolate. This is a cocoa pod that has been broken here and inside are these white sticky cocoa beans that are then fermented and dried to make cocoa beans that go into the chocolate that we eat. We have sugarcane at number four. Number five are coffee cherries. Um, inside these, there are two seeds that are then roasted and that's the bean that we are very familiar with. And of course, uh, vanilla, which is most commonly grown in Madagascar. Now, the, the aim of this quiz, and I hope that what it shows, and if you do this with children, is that in the UK, we are quite detached from where our food and drink and clothes come from. And we don't think a huge amount, the, the general population don't think a huge amount when we're consuming produce about all of the people and places that were involved in its production. So this is a fantastic way to get learners thinking about the fact that our products had a life far beyond the point that we picked them up in the supermarket or perhaps had a snack at break time and it's a good entry into talking about some of the issues around fair trade. Because the reality is, at the moment, and I'm sure that many of you will feel that in particular this week, that when young people turn on the news or go onto social media, if they're on social media, we are bombarded by a lot of very overwhelming issues. And we're living in a very complex, interdependent and rapidly changing world at the moment. And these are some of the things that young people might be confronted with, you know, when, when they're turning on their televisions or listening to the radio or having conversations with their peers. And um, so it's really important that young people develop the emotional and ethical literacy and the knowledge and the skills and the understanding to be able to navigate um, living in our complex interconnected world and um, understand how actually they can make a difference within this complex web of issues. And that's where fair trade as a topic for learning is a really good way to start to address some of these issues. And we'll move on to explore a little bit about how you can do that through um, meeting some of our fantastic speakers. So before we go on to meet the rest of the speakers, um, 
I just wanted to touch on national curriculums across the UK because I know that we're, we're really lucky to have teachers and educators in the room today from all over the UK. So I know we've got teachers from Scotland and England and Wales and potentially some from Northern Ireland, I think, today. So just having a look on the map here is that fair trade obviously sits very well with an outcomes in the curriculum aligning exactly with history and science and geography and citizenship and your humanities but beyond that it's a fantastic topic for interdisciplinary learning and learning for sustainability in general. Now in Scotland, we've got learning for sustainability policy that I've popped on the right hand side there. But I think this is a really useful visual to see all of the different ways that fair trade um, it can meet and be a fantastic context for, for, for learning about some of these issues. So for example, developing political literacy, outdoor learning, local to global, human rights, children's rights, sustainable development education, social justice, peace and conflict. There's a huge amount in there that you can explore through exploring fair trade and climate change in your classroom. Now, it's if you're new to the subject, it can seem quite overwhelming because um, it is quite a complex issue. So just to get an understanding, oh, I don't know if I've got my confidence indicator in here after all, everybody. Um, I think I'm going to pass on to Catherine. Is that right? And Catherine, you're going to do a little bit of a survey. I don't think it's me. I think I got muddled up there. So I'm going to pass on to Catherine Newman from the Scottish Fair Trade Forum. And she is going to introduce another speaker. I do apologise, we've got another speaker, Mark Langdon, along with Catherine. So I'll leave you to introduce each other. Thanks, Catherine. There we go. I had to find myself and, and <laughs> to unmute. Okay, so thanks for the introduction, Claire, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so the Scottish Fair Trade Forum was involved over a month ago in um, this same session, along with Fair Trade Schools and the One World Centre, and we're really happy to have been invited along again today. So Claire has done a great job of introducing us. So we're Scotland's Fair Trade Network and we receive some funding from the Scottish Government for our work to um, promote fair trade in Scotland. So we work with fair trade groups, with schools, with businesses um, and just getting the message out there to choose fair trade. And as Claire said, um, the 10 principles underpin all of the work that we do. So what have we been doing for Fair Trade Fortnight? We've had two key events and I'll pop in the chat after I've spoken links to these. So our first event took place on Saturday and um, it's now up on our YouTube channel for anyone who's interested to go and listen back. And we've got a second event coming up on Thursday, as you can see there, which um, I'll also put the event right link into the chat for you. And you'd be very welcome to join us if you're available. So um, what we're touching on today is just the resource that's out there in our fair trade groups. So in Scotland, we have around 80 fair trade communities around the country. And the Fair Trade Foundation have a link on their website to this map, which we can pop in the chat. Um, and you can go along and, and have a look at what Fair Trade groups are in your local area and get in touch because they're uh, a great resource for talks in schools, for information. Um, these people meet regularly, they come to our events, they keep their ear to the ground when it comes to Fair Trade. So they're a really good resource to tap into and I'm just going to pass over to Mark Langdon who joins us from Glasgow's Fair Trade Co-op just to give us a wee bit more information about what a Fair Trade group could offer a school. 
Hi there, thanks very much Catherine uh, and thanks Claire and everybody for the invite to come along. It's lovely to see such a wide representation from across the UK. On St David's Day, my dad was uh, Welsh and I was born in Belfast, so see we have someone from Belfast here. And um, we've got Louise uh, from Corpus Christi School, which is just around the corner for where I'm working from home uh, in, in Glasgow in, in Knightswood. Um, We've also got Linda on the call who works the, the Rainbow Turtle in Paisley and who is part of the Glasgow Fair Trade um, Cooperative. And I'm just going to pop the, the website for the Rainbow Turtle as an example of the kind of resource that you might have near you um, in terms of the, you know, this fantastic grassroots work going around to support um, there's a, a thing called Gavin's Mill in a, in the kind of um, sort of Beta Mill Guy area in Glasgow, the kind of north. Of, so that you'll find somewhere around you, um, there'll be people, you know, on the ground working to support fair trade, and the support of schools and teachers is invaluable to have a mutually supportive relationship, and really. I think I, I was lucky enough myself to go along to COP26. Um, lucky was a kind of, you know, double-edged kind of thing, but a very interesting experience. And the Glasgow Fair Trade Co-op actually ran an event during the, the COP26 with um, different fair trade producers from um, countries across the world and other uh, cities uh, where they've got fair trade movements. And these are the kind of events that come up and uh, we're really keen to have schools and teachers involved in that. We're lucky to have uh, Maria, who, who's one of the teacher representatives that comes along from Glasgow City Council to the Glasgow Fair Trade Co-op. And uh, I've got a very dear sister who sits in the, the, um, the group in Edinburgh, um, where there's a lot of support again from the kind of City Council. And so you get the understanding that what you're doing in the schools is absolutely invaluable. Um, but we are always very keen. The kind of things that the Glasgow Fair Trade Co-op would, would offer is, <laughs> um, this might be nice for the teachers, but not so much for the pupils. We are doing a, a, fair, a fair trade rum tasting on Thursday night. I'm afraid all the tickets are sold, but um, <laughs> but yeah, that's a kind of more unusual one. But the, we're always looking for ways in which we can help um, um, teachers to make the experience of dealing with fair trade much more kind of in the real world for all ages of, of children. So at the moment we are looking to work on a kind of mural um, idea for in the city and we would like to have young people involved in kind of thinking about what do we put in the mural and those kind of designs. There's really our we were kind of only limited by our imaginations, by the way that we can support teaching um, and give you um, support, speakers to come along to support it. We've got great representatives of um, yeah, Glasgow, yes. <laughs> tell me Scots, um, the city growers. We've got a, a cooperative in, uh, in Glasgow, which fears, sells a lot of fair trade food. So. Say again, Green City. Thank you very much, Green City. But these are like examples of where people who are who are selling fair trade foods, a whole incredible range of different varieties, and uh, have connections with producers as well. That we can, through the wonderful power of Zoom and, and Teams, we can bring into the classroom um, to, to to talk to young people and answer their questions. So just to put out a warm invitation there. It's you know not just for kind of um, teachers in Glasgow, but you'll find similar kind of organisations to ours up and down the country. So please make that kind of link, and we'll be very pleased to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. That's great. So Claire has um, outlined the aims of today's session. So before we move on, we're just going to do a check on where you are in terms of being really confident or clueless in, um, around the links between fair trade and climate change. So um, you would go to view options on your screen if you're able to and find the annotate function and somehow with a squiggle or a love heart or whatever else is available, pop yourself on the washing line where you, you think you fit. 
I'll give you just a couple of minutes to do this until we've got a few more. Excellent. Great, some squiggles and lip hearts are appearing. Nobody's feeling totally clueless. Brilliant. I'm just going to take a quick shot. I'm hoping that um, everyone's had a chance to do that now. So by way of an introduction to the next part, which is uh, Sally and Josh from the One World Centre, I'm going to play a very short film that we produced for COP26, obviously, to make the links between fair trade and climate change at that time. The devastating Is that playing? No. no. It's not. The impact of the climate crisis on the most marginalised and who are least responsible for the current status is of grave concern. It's just not fair for farming communities already suffering the worst effects of climate change to pick up the bill for dealing with a crisis they've done the least to cause. Our co-farmers have the, the big challenges of the climate change. Farmers and workers worldwide, they want governments to keep their promises especially providing the $100 billion pledged to communities hit hardest by the climate crisis and making sure that they can take a leading role in deciding how it is spent. Placing people and planet before profits, fair trade calls out to all businesses to transform their business systems and join the movement for trade and climate justice. We have planted the shade trees to maintain the water in the soil. During the exceptional rainfall, the flood, we have also tried to build the parabolic prayer house where we dry the country to meet the challenges caused by the climate change. Here in Scotland, we can make a difference. We can you know, choose to buy fair trade products from fair trade businesses. Fair trade and ethical values are good for business. To our customers, uh, from the feedback that we get, they feel proud and they feel good to, to consume a product that they enjoy and they think it's good quality and feel good about it. It's also about ensuring that we join our voices here in Scotland with the voices around the globe to make that collective call for change in the way in which business and trade is done. There's no climate justice without trade justice. And so we need to act now and address these issues together. Fair trade is the ethical choice for individuals, businesses and governments to take action. So join us in campaigning for a more just world in this vibrant fair trade nation. That ends my piece and I'm going to hand over to Josh from the One World Centre. Thanks everyone. Hi, <clears throat> hi everybody. Uh, bear with me two secs while I just share my screen. Uh, where are we? Here we go. And let's, here we go. Hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. My name is, oh, I'm on the wrong. Let's start from the beginning, that would make more sense. Uh, my name's Josh and I'm a global learning advisor at the One World Centre in Dundee. And my colleague Sally is going to uh, follow me shortly. Um, in this section, we're just going to kind of look uh, a little bit of the kind of the background as to why fair trade exists and going to make some connections to climate justice and climate change. And then Sally will have lots of ideas for resources and activities that you can use as well. <clears throat> we'll share all of this with you, so don't feel you have to scribble have scribble stuff down as we go along. We'll, we'll share all of this with you. Uh, but just I'd just like to kind of pick up on the, the things that have already come out of, of listening to everyone else talk so far is just how 
how much fair trade is lots and lots and lots of different people, lots of individuals sort of coming together to make a, a really big difference. And I think that's a really powerful thing, particularly when we're talking to young people who are still finding out how the world works, uh, realizing that they can be a small part of, of big change. I think that's a really powerful thing. And certainly fair trade wouldn't exist without individuals. It's not, you know, a big, a big thing separate from us. It's, it's all of us put together. Uh, that, that is, is why fair trade exists. Anyway, let's move along a little bit. <clears throat> just wanted to start by asking you, if you could pop in the chat, just what your favorite fair trade product is. And if you have a reason as to why, uh, just pop that in the chat as well. I'll just, uh, just give you a minute or so. <clears throat> Okay, so someone's saying flowers, uh, divine chocolate, bananas, chocolate every time. Yeah, I think I probably have to agree. Bananas, tea, coffee, Kit Kat, bananas, fair trade clothing. Yeah, coffee, wine, Taylor's coffee, chocolate, wine. It's certainly good to see more and more fair trade wine in the shops, definitely. And fair phone, somebody's put, yeah, an immediate discussion point, very much so, yes. So if I'd, if my teachers had asked me this when I was at school, I, I think probably about three of the things that are on the screen would have been an, an option. Certainly wouldn't have had fair trade footballs. Fair trade or fair phone was certainly not even, I don't think it was even, you know, it would have been a dream for people that were involved in fair trade. Uh, fair trade uniforms, I don't think would have, would have been, uh, would have been around at all, flowers. So that shows just how much has changed in the last 30 years or so. And all of that really, or a, a huge amount of that, as I've, as I've kind of alluded to, is, is to do with individuals. But so much of that is to do with teachers and educators, I think, because most young people now, uh, as they navigate their way through school, uh, they will probably come across a keen teacher like yourself who's going to make sure that fair trade forms part of, of what you teach them. Fair trade is certainly not something that everybody has to learn about, but there's teachers like you that ensure that, uh, that each generation of young people can, probably can't escape their education without uh, finding out about fair trade. And that's a really, really important thing. And I think uh, teachers like yourself should be proud uh, of all the work that you've done in, in making sure that all of these different products are now available. And hopefully in another 20, 30 years, even more, more things will be available and we'll have more than just fair phones, hopefully fair computers and all sorts of different things as well. So let me move us along a little bit. So I really like this image here because it's very, very striking because we're all used to kind of finding the fair trade section in the shop. Uh, but often it's easy to forget uh, that most of the other things, not everything by any means, but uh, uh, the vast majority of the, the other products in the shop have probably been unfairly uh, produced. So the, the, the workers, uh, maybe the people who are delivering things, all sorts of people in the chain have been unfairly treated or unfairly rewarded for the work that they do. And I think this is a really nice image to share with young people because it really kind of brings out that, um, you know, the, the stock uh, or the, the difference really that there's just a, such a small proportion of products in the supermarkets uh, that have the fair trade logo on or, or kind of mention ethics. Uh, although obviously there's a, a massive increase over the last uh, five years or so. But yeah, it's just a really nice image for, for kind of sharing uh, really kind of the, the vast amount of unfair, unfairly traded goods. So what do we mean by it? by unfair trade. Well, I'm gonna kind of look at and think about why, why is so much uh, trade unfair? First of all, unfair trade puts profit before people and planet, which is obviously something everyone in the room knows, I'm sure. When we're talking to young people about this, is, is I think very important to give them a bit of context, not just, you know, just explain it like this. We can look back to history and kind of work out why this, why this is, is as it is. So what, what else puts profit before people and planet? Well, colonial, colonialism certainly, certainly did. 
uh, does, or you could say, um, exploiting people, um, not only exploiting them, but degrading them, making them, uh, uh, categorizing them as, as lesser beings, but going in, stealing land, stealing their, um, their goods, also, you know, deliberately killing them, uh, um, um, inflicting violence upon them. Um, so that's that's something that putting that simple putting profit uh, ab above uh, people and planet is something that we've been doing for centuries. And capitalism, the the kind of the financial system or the way that we uh, that we we work, that does exactly the same thing as well by by putting uh, capital and profit as the kind of the highest thing that we could we could achieve and forgetting that um, we really need to look after the people that um, help us to make money and the people that help us to make the profit and that it's uh, it's important when we're talking to young people who are still under you know beginning to understand how the world works and how these this system uh, and economics and these kind of things work is to explain this to them and un unpack these things with them because the more that they understand the systems that have created unfair trade uh, it, the more likely they are going to be able to come up with solutions, but also they'll they'll possibly, I think, feel less guilty about it because it's very easy to present all of this, you know, the injustices around fair trade, and that's quite a, that's quite a big emotional load to to dump onto young people who haven't been responsible in creating the system and haven't been responsible for making things as they are. So if we can give them a bit of history and help them to understand exactly why things are like this. It kind of it gives them a bit of distance, but also gives them the, the, the power and the understanding to help address the issues and to help um, move us forward in a more positive way, I hope. And also when we, <clears throat> excuse me, also when we think um, about the, the models of economic growth, we all often hear politicians and business people talking about how important it is that the economy is growing and all this kind of thing. But if we, we're talking about climate justice and climate change, we can't simply just keep producing and producing and producing and, uh, you know, uh, focusing only on this kind of unsustainable model of economic growth. We need a circular economy. We need to think about different ways, cleverer ways of recycling our technology, of uh, ways of not mining the planet, of not exploiting the planet and, and its people endlessly for obvious reasons, because we can't do that because it's a, we kind of live on a finite planet with finite uh, resources so it really is time that we kind of that we come up with with sustainable ways of doing it and we need the people at the top to start talking the language of sustainability not still hopping on about how important economic growth is without addressing the fact that it needs to be sustainable so hopefully if we can help young people and obviously some of this is quite complex, so you might there might be uh, it might be more suited to older pupils. But there are ways that you can just very slowly introduce these kind of ideas of sustainability and, and beginning to understand why we are at the at the point that we are now in terms of uh, unfair trade and 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 how trade is. <clears throat> so we can pair fair trade. <clears throat> Excuse me, in my cough. I apologise. Uh, fair trade does the opposite so it puts people and planet before profit this is probably why we're all here because we most of us would would uh, or we all believe that that is a much better thing to do but, uh, more than that fair trade is a reaction to unfair trade so fair trade exists only because people like ourselves have seen that unfair trade exists and we've riled against it and and decided that there has to be a better way and that we can't just sit around and that we need to, whether it's um, just by changing the, our, our shopping habits or whether it's like the founders of Tradecraft uh, seeing that a war was happening in the country and realizing that instead of sending empty planes back, they would um, send goods back from the country and then give the people in that country a chance to earn some money and, and earn their way out of poverty. So there's lots and lots of simple activities and um, actions like that have, that have helped fair trade to come about and it's yeah it's, it's a real example of how citizens can bring about change so it's that's where again when we're talking with young people it's a really good thing to to show young people that all of this only exists because of individuals and particularly because of schools a classroom of uh, primary school children are incredibly powerful they're much more powerful than if I went into Tesco's and said I want all of your chocolate to be fair trade why isn't your fair trade 
uh, wasn't your chocolate all fair trade, I'd probably be escorted from the building by the bouncer or the, by the security guards fairly quickly. Whereas if a, a, a school, a, a class full of primary school children went in and did that, they might have a, an, a local counselor might appear for a photo and then all of a sudden you've got a discussion happening. So um, fair trade is very, very much about the power of individuals coming together and kind of encouraging and, and bringing about this change. And yes, as um, <clears throat> I think Claire mentioned earlier on, uh, if you're not already familiar with the principles, which I'm sure you are, uh, these uh, are just kind of the, the, the principles of fair trade, and they, they link nicely to the sustainable development goals as well, which I think we'll mention briefly as well. But there's lots of ways into this as, as teachers and as educators, lots of ways that you can, lots of angles that you can come at this. Okay. <clears throat> So it, lots of you will probably be familiar with Oxfam and their education work. Uh, they have some global citizenship guides, which we'll share, we'll share the links uh, with you. I was muted then by a host. I don't know which, who's trying to uh, uh, get me to shut up, but I'll hurry up. I think oh, I'm nearly I out of time, to, actually. I tried to um, get someone into the um, session and... <laughs> Josh, I'm sorry. It's all right, don't worry. Um, so yeah, in the Oxfam Global Citizenship Guides, they kind of identify some key themes uh, for global citizenship. So these, these are what they, what they are, so human rights, social justice and equity, power and governance. All of these link, uh, link really nicely with fair trade. So whatever angle, you've probably already looked at fair trade before with, with your pupils. But hopefully these themes might give you ideas for, for slightly different ways into fair trade. And we're going to think of some other ways shortly as well. Um, and to go with the themes uh, that um, Oxfam have come up with the, some values and attitudes. These are global citizenship values and attitudes and skills as well. If you're, um, if you're working in Scotland, that's the, that's the education system that I know better than the other, so I'll speak on behalf of that. Um, the full capacities and the curriculum for excellence fit really, really nicely with, with um, these values, attitudes and skills. I just wanted to highlight a couple which I think are really important when we're talking about fair trade. So critical and creative thinking is obviously important on lots of different levels, particularly I think when we're talking about advertising, and young people understanding the amount of uh, power that uh, advertisers have when they're trying to get into our brains to get us to buy these things. They sell us these ideals and these um, kind of perfect lifestyles and all these kind of things. These is almost kind of like a form of brainwashing really to try and get us to buy their products, which are usually not fair trade. And I think if we can help young people to understand the communication that has been kind of forced on them from a, from a younger age, it's a really good way of kind of building their resilience against uh, all of that, all of the billions of dollars that get put into advertising. But then also some other things over here, the sense of identity and self-esteem. I think that's a really important one because it, it, if young people can develop that sense of identity and self-esteem, realizing that they're much more than the brands, the, you know, the Nike shoes they've got on or the whatever it might be, and understanding that they don't have to, to go along with uh, the, the big brands and the uh, you know the way that um capitalism would probably like us to we don't have to buy stuff to to be something so i think that you know these kinds of things are really important so obviously we're, we're looking at what fair trade is how fair trade helps farmers how fair trade can help climate justice as well but it also it also gives you the opportunity while you're doing that to help young people you're working with to develop their own skills their own values and attitudes at the same time as as better understanding the world around them and of course, this ability to manage complex complexities and, uh, and uncertainty, this is crucial because so much of this is so complicated. It's not black and white at all. It's not this product versus this product or this issue versus this issue. All of these things are so interconnected and it's so important that um, all of us, not just young people, are, are okay with the complexity and okay with the uncertainty and that we engage with the conversation rather than shying away from it because it's so complex and because things are, are difficult, the, the more that we're able to engage with those conversations, the easier those conversations become and, and uh, the, the better uh, and the, the quicker hopefully we'll come to, to more and more solutions. 
So I'm just going to skip through that last little bit. I think Sally is, is uh, going to share something with you in a moment. Now, I'm going to, we're not going to play these videos, but there's a couple of videos here. We wanted to make the connection between uh, racism and uh, fair trade and climate change, but you don't need a white Englishman to talk to you about racism, so I'm not going to do that. Um, we've got two, there's two videos here. So this is one, uh, one by David Lammy, and the, the kind of the, the headline from it is that the climate crisis is, in a way, colonialism's natural conclusion. And in that video, he talks about how people of colour have been exploited and how people of colour are still, uh, still experiencing um, the effects of climate change much more. Uh, so I'd encourage you to watch that. There's a three minute version and there's also a nine minute version. So find the nine minute version if you can. Or in fact, we will share that with you. And then there's also um, some new videos produced by the Fair Trade Foundation in time for, for Fair Trade Fortnight. And I've just put like the, the headline from one of the videos here is that wealthy nations have a long history of exploiting people, land and nature for their own profit. So again, kind of making that point that, that we touched on earlier about how none of this is new. I think in understanding that this isn't new, that kind of helps to not give us a bit of distance because obviously it's still happening right now, but to, to be able to stand back to look at um, why, why it's not new, why it's been happening for so long and how people have counted it in the past. Uh, particularly indigenous people, it's really important and people of color, it's really important to, to acknowledge their um, objections and their, um, uh, I've, I've, I've lost the word I'm looking for, but their, their um, uh, I've totally lost the word the fact that they've been engaged with trying to stop this exploitation happening. I think you probably uh, get the gist of what I'm trying to say, apologies. There's also um, a Greenpeace video, which is called, I think something along the lines of, is the climate crisis racist? We'll share those with you as well. But yeah, I'd encourage you to, to make sure that you um, include this kind of discussion when we're talking about fair trade and climate change as well, because it's a really important element of the discussion that we, we really should include. And just very quickly to just, here's a couple of quotes from Mike Gidney, the CEO of Fairtrade Foundation, kind of making similar uh, or kind of backing up those points. But uh, he mentions that the, the tariffs, the complex web of tariff and non-tariff barriers. So if you think about why people in Ghana can grow cocoa for chocolate, but yet we, we buy chocolate produced by people outside of Ghana. And one of the main reasons for that is because of the tariffs. Uh, involved so that it would make it so expensive for them to actually produce the chocolate because of the, the export tariffs and these are important kind of obstructions that um, that can kind of go on unknown unless you uh, unless you kind of dig into the details of trade but then you're also making the point about how the, the slave trade and sugar was controlled by European colonizers so yeah all of the all of the the, the, the systems of trade and the way that trade works is certainly um, built upon uh, um, what's happened in the past and most of that has been designed by rich white men. So just to finish my section here, just be interesting to see how uh, how do you think you could use this or do you think this would be a useful thing to use with your young people and what do you think they would say about this picture if you presented it to them? What, what conclusions do you think they might come to? Or um, uh, what do you think they might think the picture was trying to say? Be interested to hear what you have to say. And if you could pop something in the chat, that would be great. <clears throat> okay, I'm not seeing too much action in the chat, so I think I might just hand over to Sally and perhaps Sally, if you see anything in the chat, you could pick up for me. Sally, are you there? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Josh. Yes, all the ideas are, are coming in, are coming in there now. OK, well, we could always go back to the wee um, cartoon if we have a time later on, but I'm conscious that um, we're a wee bit behind schedule, so I'm just going to, to push on. OK, so we're, there's been lots already spoken about um, trade and the history of trade and how it's been going on for 
centuries uh, and we're just going to have a quick look at the the current drivers um, for international trade and, and the impact that it's having on our world so you can see in the photographs here um, one of the results of of all our purchases are a huge amount of electronic waste uh, a lot of plastic pollution greenhouse gas emissions um, and also our consumption patterns are driving deforestation. Now, I was uh, on the, the call that Catherine spoke about on Saturday, and it was very interesting. There was a, I think he was a professor from Stirling University, Gerard Hastings, and he said the problem really is it's not just consumption, it's hyper consumption. So this is countries in the industrialized north, um, consuming huge amounts of resources from um, all parts of the world uh, and behaving as if we had at least two and a half, three planets, um, when, as Josh said, of course, we live in a world of finite resources. So there are lots of, of impacts of the things that we buy. And I'm sure that in your teaching, whatever stage or subject you teach, you will have touched on some of these issues. And I just wonder if you'd like to perhaps pop in the chat uh, how your learners sort of respond to uh, the links between their own lifestyles and what's happening in the world. Do they, do they get the connections? Um, or if you want to, to refer to, to any piece of work that you've done uh, that touches on uh, any of these issues about how our, our lifestyles are, are driving um, global problems. So I'll just give you a wee, a wee minute to have a think about the connections and how learners make these connections between their own lives and the products they are buying and, and things that they hear about happening in the world. Yes, and I'm just having a look at some previous comments here about, about the cartoon showing how consumerism strips away the natural resources of the world. And peeling back the problems that greed causes. Yeah, with, with little ones, it is difficult, I agree. Um, but the Fair Trade Foundation has got a new set of resources that are particularly for early years. Um, and we can share these with you afterwards. I think Claire will probably be referring to them later on. Oh, yeah, you, you have. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yep, so with some help, the primary school children do make connections. Mixed responses. Um, Jonathan's saying he did some work on the global goals. Mixed results. Mm. Yeah, primary three, four and five, perhaps it is quite difficult for them. Secondary, it should be easier. And um, there's somebody talking about news round, which quite a few schools um, do use in order to try and generate conversation right okay that's great thank you so maybe if we just move on to the next slide josh thanks yeah right um and actually just move on to the next one because i think that shows us yeah the fair phone now somebody mentioned the fair phone earlier and I don't know, I think it was Jackie. I don't want to put you on the spot, Jackie. But if you would like to come off mute and just tell us a wee bit about the fair phone, it'd be nice to hear from, from one of the participants instead of from us. Maybe Jackie's not still here. Okay, so it's just to say it is a, a smartphone. Um, but it's a smartphone that can be taken to bits because one of the problems with phones, modern phones, is that they can't be repaired and if something goes wrong, generally you have to throw it away. The other main problem is in the conflict materials that are used, um, at the essential components of the phone. With the fair phone, there are no conflict minerals. Um, everything has been as ethically sourced as possible. And you can, you can replace the battery. So again, it lasts a wee bit longer. 
So you can buy a fair phone online and it does everything that a, another smartphone would do. I've had one for some time and um, I think it's great. I'm not saying it's the absolute answer to everything, but if you need to have a smartphone, then I would say that the fair phone is the, the best option. Okay, so if we just move on to the to the next one then. So this is um, a couple of resources here from our colleagues at Scott Deck in Edinburgh. They are the Development Education Centre in Edinburgh and they produce a lot of their own materials. And Youth of the World is one that you can use with learners uh, in informal as well as formal settings to explore where things come from, um, mobile phones, chocolate, uh, our clothing, etc. So looking at the, the lives of the people that have been referred to uh, earlier on. And they're very interactive um, materials. So you've got sort of simulation games and, and ways that you can try to engage young people so that they um, they are involved and they help to, it helps to see the connections between their lifestyles, what they are buying, what they are eating, using, um, and people around the world. Okay, so if we can just move on to the next one then. Yeah, yes, yeah. so as a few people have mentioned already, the whole um, notion of consumerism and just about everything in the world these days seems to be um, so complicated. And this is a, a quote from one of my heroes, George Monboyo, who was interviewed by Frankie Boyle um, last year. Uh, actually, he was initially asked to talk about plastic waste and what he was saying was that it was the consumers have been sort of demonized for all the plastic waste when actually it's the the companies that produce the the, the plastic and, and the packaging companies that are to blame but he, he, what he says here is the only way we're going to stop tra trashing the planet is not to be consumers anymore and to be citizens. So I wonder if you can just think about what is he actually saying here? What does he mean by this? Are we going to stop being consumers? Can we stop being consumers? Any, any thoughts? Right, so Emily's saying being thoughtful to others. Yep, we need to think before we buy. Indeed, overconsumption encourages companies. Yep, yep. Yeah, yes, all of these things. Promoting re reduce, which is a, um, or even refuse, um, which is a, at the top of the hierarchy, reuse uh, and recycle as a, as a last resort. Yeah, yeah. So what does that actually mean then for fair trade? Um, because fair trade, let's face it, is a consumer led movement. So I guess for fair trade, it does mean thinking about, well, actually, do I need to buy this in the first place? Can I find a fair trade option of this or an, or an ethical option? Um, and a lot of the fair trade products are things that we can't buy in this country anyway. They're not produced like cocoa, bananas, um, coffee, etc. Okay, so if you could pop up the, the rest of that slide, thanks. Yeah, and I'll just have a quick look in the chat box. Yes, ma about making products repairable um, that we should all become we could use charity shops as a as a first um, point of call. So we're not saying don't buy fair trade. Um, we're encouraging people to think about all of their purchases, uh, and that fair trade is an ethical alternative. And very often it it is already organic, may not be certified, but, um, but the fair trade products uh, always have an environmental um, have good environmental credentials as well. Okay, so moving on, 
Yeah, now this has been referred to already. Um, when things are overwhelming, these are what happens. You get people feeling guilty and apathetic about it, feeling, oh, well, there's nothing we can do and just, just give up. Um, there's lots of evidence, in, including from Dr. Keith Skeen at Dundee University, uh, about the danger of overwhelming people and how it can be counterproductive. So it's always a balance between helping the kids to understand that there are these problems in the world, but not um, to the extent that they, they just switch off or feel guilty. Um, and it's, it's important to get that balance right. On the plus side, um, and the global citizenship skills and themes are all about trying to uh, encourage critical thinking, um, understanding why things are the way they are, um, knowing the difference between um, fact and opinion, etc. And so when we are informed and aware, then we're more likely to get um, a very positive outcome. And I think we're then on to the... Right, yeah, so I'm not going to go back. Josh has explained these um, in great detail, the values, attitudes and skills that the teaching about fair trade develops in young people. And this is our last slide. So that's our contact details there. If I can also please make a plea to those of you who are on the call to put your correct name or your full name, um, rename yourselves or pop it in the chat. It's just to make sure that we can tick you off on the register and make sure that I send you everything that we've promised that you will be sent. Okay, thank you very much. I am going to hand over, I think, to Andy now, is that right? Thank you, Sally. Good afternoon, everybody. Hoping you can see that. So my name's Andy and I'm the Managing Director of Cool Schools. Um, as the students like to point out to us, we're not very good at spelling, but hopefully we're a bit better at, uh, at fair trade. Um, I'm conscious time is moving on, so uh, let me try and be both informative and, and brief with this uh, little presentation. First, a bit about our company, Cool Schools. Uh, we were founded in 2010 when we uh, gained our fair trade license and we imported our first uh, batch of fair trade school uniform into the UK in 2011. Every single piece of clothing that we have ever manufactured uh, contains fair trade cotton. And um, since 2018, all of our clothing is also uh, carried only uh, recycled polyester in the poly cotton mixes. Um, either side of uh, the photos of our cotton farmers on the left and the factory uh, on the right is a map of India. Um, those three region, regions that you see arrowed in the middle, Maharashtra, Orissa and Telangana, are where the mar marginalized uh, cotton farmers are that produce cotton for our business. Um, there's an umbrella not-for-profit organization called Chetna Organic that we work with through our factory chain. And since their foundation in 2004, they have converted over 30,000 conventional small scale cotton farmers from conventional farming use of pesticides, harmful pesticides and fertilizers and so on to uh, or thoroughly organic uh, cotton farming. That process takes uh, three years, believe it or not. So there's a huge amount of work that goes into um, the individual farming villages that uh, Chet and Organic have worked with, but it's a fantastically inspiring story. And, um, uh, they are the largest organization of their kind uh, globally. The fourth arrow down at the bottom is uh, uh, Tamil Nadu, where in a, in a city called Tirupur is one of our ethically um, uh, uh, fair trade licensed factories that produces the garments for our business, uh, Cool Schools. Um, so there are two main elements to uh, the fair trade, to, to Cool Schools business. Um, first, um, the establishment of ongoing fair trade educational partnerships with our client schools UK wide, all of which we run at no cost to schools. Um, how do we get involved in fair trade education as a fair trade business? Well, very simply, the very first school that we started supplying down here in Southampton asked us if we come 
in and speak to the students about where we source our cotton from and so on. So it very obviously, very quickly became obvious to us that uh, we should be doing this. And uh, what, what was the point of supplying fair trade uniform if the students uh, wearing the uniform didn't understand why the schools had made the ethical clothing choice? Um, we're based in Southampton on the South Coast, but we love traveling to schools all over the UK. And no school, I promise you, is too far away for us. Um, in Scotland, for example, we have around 50 client schools and we've visited just about all of them, including on Orkney and in Ullapool and Corpus Christi in Glasgow that um, <laughs> Mark Langdon uh, mentioned earlier. And good afternoon to Louise White. Thanks for joining us. Um, the education partnerships involve the running of fair trade assemblies and class sessions and talking to school student fair trade and eco groups and student councils. We deliver presentations to PTAs and parent groups and we also talk to uh, many of our wonderful fair, UK fair trade campaign groups uh, nationwide. Um, we also offer past coded lesson plans on fair trade and fair trade cotton on the Cool Schools website. So all you need to do to get, get one of those pass codes is send me an email. Um, the important point for us, though, is really what I touched on earlier, that the students understand why their school has made an ethical clothing choice. And in learning all about our sustainable cotton journey, they hopefully become more enlightened uh, global citizens as a result. We come to the second uh, main element to the Cool Schools business, the fair trade eco uniform itself. Now, I don't want to make this a sales pitch, but I do need to need to under, uh, explain to you um, that at the very start of our business back in 2010, we realized that although our fair trade uniform was certainly not going to be the UK's most expensive school uniform, by the same token, we couldn't really compete with the big supermarket and some of the big, um, big school wholesalers. It's a very profits driven business, the school uniform business. So in many ways we're market disruptors or we pretend to be. Um, we, we, we've always worked very hard together with our factories to produce a quality of uniform that uh, our customers tell us has consistently been well above the average school uniform quality. And that's, I guess, the quid pro quo we have with the schools. So if schools are saying, yes, we would like to introduce fair trade cotton, we know and they will know that they're not, as it were, being being sold a pub. Um, so um, um, we supply schools in Scotland, which for some time has been our fastest growing market, Wales, Northern Ireland and England, and make it easy. We, we try and make it very easy for schools either to convert completely to fair trade uniform or to offer a fair trade choice to students and parents alongside existing suppliers. So having covered the uniform, just, just to give you just a, a quick insight into the sort of education that we're doing, we're, we're obviously talking a lot about the cotton and the cotton farmers um, and how fair trade impacts on them. Uh, there's some very harrowing stories. We don't obviously say this to the very young children, but just to introduce the theme of cotton growing in developing countries in India over the last 20 years, uh, about a quarter of a million cotton farmers have committed suicide due to the uh, globally fluctuating cotton price. I was a little bit skeptical about that statistic uh, before my first visit to India, but on that first visit back in 2014, there was virtually no cotton farmer that we spoke to that didn't mention a relative or a friend who'd been a victim of the phenomenon of um, farmers lending money to buy seeds, fertilizers and pesticides at the start of the growing season, only to find that the cotton price is tanked. Six months later, when they come to harvest their cotton, can't sell it, become desperate. And um, so it, it obviously we, we, we're very careful about how we put this message across to the different age groups of students. Um, but um, but it, it, it's certainly uh, the reason why we are very motivated to sell as much uh, fair trade cotton as we as we possibly can. And this is a slide that, um, we, that we often put up in our assemblies to, to just to, to show children uh, the extent of a clothing chain, starting from the, the, the cotton growing, which is about a six, seven, eight month process through through to harvest, arriving then with the ginning factory, then to the spinning factory, uh, then in the form of cotton yarn onto the knitting factory where it's dyed with recycled, where, where, sorry, where it's knitted together with recycled polyester, then onto the dyeing factory, and then finally onto the CMT cut, make and trim uh, factory. Um, five factories altogether in that process, um, which we asked the students to tell us at the end of 
uh, of the slide. Also to try and remember the names of the various um, factories. It just gives the students an idea of the magnitude of the um, of a clothing chain and and such a long journey that their clothing takes, and also the number of people employed in making their uh, in making their clothing. Um, the supply chain that we work, work with um, through Chetna and our um, Debella factory chain, work with the cotton farmers to combat the challenge of climate change. Um, in my last visit to India, on my last visit to India way back in 2019, of course, we haven't been able to visit India since due to COVID. I spent a week with the cotton farmers in the Telangana region of India and saw firsthand the, 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 the um, uh, people you see in the middle of the slide there, Mr. and Mrs. Atram, I spent a day uh, picking cotton uh, on their farm. Pretty, uh, pretty back-breaking work, frankly speaking, um, and but but thoroughly enjoyable. Uh, they really are um, wonderful people and very hardworking people, very very proud people, and um, really, the the main messages to us are: all we want to do is be able to sell our cotton at a fair price at the end of our cotton harvest and then we're happy. And, and also for the fair trade cotton farmers, a real um, you know, acknowledgement of the fact that they were the lucky ones and um, that, that they know literally thousands of farmers in their district that would want to become a part of the fair trade family but can't. And the reason for that is just very briefly, 70% of our clothes are made with cotton and less than 1% of those clothes carry the fair trade cotton mark. So I continue to believe that's a fairly depressing statistic. Um, you can see there's some of the ways in which Chetna Organic works with the, uh, with the farmers, with the organic cotton farmers on, um, on methods that mitigate climate change. Um, these are some of the messages that we obviously put uh, over to the students when we're doing the assemblies and class sessions. And we also have the little prop like here for example I can assure you that wasn't one that I picked earlier in my garden here in the new forest um, that tends to um, uh, yes, seeing the actual cotton live cotton tends to make make students uh, sit up. We're, that's what we're trying to do with this um, with the education side of this business is to um, is to help children understand the journey um, and uh, the fair trade and the link between fair trade and climate change as well, which obviously has been a theme uh, of this afternoon. Um, how to get involved? Well, do please send me an email um, and we can start planning a Cool Schools educational visit to your school. Um, we, we, we tend to try and group two or three schools together in an area before we visit. Obviously, often we're making, making long journeys. So if we can get two or three interested schools in a cluster or what, whatever it will be, then um, we're very, very happy to come and visit. All we ask schools to do is consider the introduction of a fair trade uniform choice. Obviously, we'd, we'd like it if, if schools can convert completely to fair trade uniform, but we understand that there's always an existing supplier. Uh, and so we're happy to supply online in parallel or if schools buy in bulk from us or where it's simply not possible, say, for example, to persuade the senior leadership uh, team to, um, to, 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 to introduce a fair trade uniform choice. There are other ways uh, that you can do it at your school. For example, fair trade leavers for these is a very, very popular one uh, for us and, and, and a growing um, you know, source of um, fair trade uh, cotton business. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's it for me. So I hope I've been uh, kept to my 10 minutes and um, thank you for listening and do, do please uh, get in touch and, and send me any questions that you might have either by email or in, in the chat. Very, very happy to answer. So thank you very much. I think now I'm due to hand over to Tracy Mitchell at JTS. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, I would normally often be wearing my Cool Schools um, JTS polo shirt, but um, it's in the wash, so it's, it's not um, on me today. And it's really good quality. I would thoroughly recommend it. My daughter wore cool schools um, polo shirts all through primary school, and they lasted far better than most of her friends' um, supermarket ones. Um, I'm here. I think I was billed as JTS, um, the rice people. So I am going to talk about um, rice. Um, 
And I'm just going to see if I can find my PowerPoint to share. Um, hopefully you can see that. Sally, can you nod if that's OK? Brilliant. OK, so JTS stands for Just Trading Scotland. Um, we are based just outside Glasgow in the west of Scotland. And Fair Trade Fortnight is always really important for JTS. Um, it's really like part of our sort of founding thing. Um, we started 13 years ago with the arrival of a container of Kilabera rice from Malawi just in time for Fair Trade Fortnight. Um, so we had 20 plus tons of, of rice and um, yeah, had the challenge of trying to, to find a market for, for that rice. And that has um, been sort of, I guess, fundamental to who we are and how we do business ever since. We are a fair trade enterprise. We are accredited by the World Fair Trade Organization as a fair trade enterprise. We've um, been audited against the 10 principles of fair trade. We import delicious, award-winning, fairly traded food products from various countries in Africa and from the Indian subcontinent. We sell to customers throughout the UK and we seek to promote understanding through educational work. So like Andy, yes, we're a business, but we have an educational part to what we do. Um, I think my next slide is actually to try and show my video. So I'm gonna unshare that one and share a video, hopefully. Um, so I'm less confident with this. So we'll see if it works and somebody can shout at me if, it's, if you're not getting any sound. Um, the 90 kilogram rice challenge is a simple concept with a big impact. Through a combination of trading and learning, we create a link between school children in this country and in Malawi. Together we can start to build a fairer world. 90 kilos is the amount of rice a farmer in Malawi has to sell to enable one child to go to secondary school for a year. JTS is a fair trade organisation that buys rice directly from farmers associations in Malawi and sells it to schools, churches and other groups in the UK who take part in the 90 kilogram rice challenge. The participating groups receive a comprehensive package of teaching resources, fair trade information and recipe ideas together with 90 one kilo bags of very tasty Kilimbero rice. Children, parents and teachers in the UK learn about life in Malawi children, parents and teachers in Malawi experience the practical benefits of fair trade. We are global citizens. To take part in the 90 kilogram rice challenge, you can either phone 0141 255 0901 or email nicola at jts.co.uk or order online at jts.co.uk forward slash 90kg rice challenge. Sorry, did you nearly get a weight loss thing going on in the background there? <laughs> um, I'll go back to my presentation. Um, so, oh, are you getting, are you, are you stuck on the same slide? Because I am. Mm. All right, I'll let me come out of that and try again. me a moment and I will carry on with this. Um, Very impressive little video. I'm glad you liked the video. It's now causing me problems getting back to my presentation. <laughs> but, um, right, there we go. Sorry about that, folks. Um, we so the, the rice challenge has been around for as long as JTS has been around and it is fun and engaging for pupils of all ages. Um, my daughter's primary, sorry, nursery did this when she was at nursery stage and her primary school did it as a inter-house challenge when she was at primary school. She's now at secondary school and I've not managed that one yet, but maybe soon. Um, 
it's ideal for pupils preparing for secondary because a lot of the information is about the transition from primary school to probably not going to secondary school. Um, and there are lesson plans for all different ages, but for me, that feels like a, an obvious time to be doing it. Within secondary school, it would fit within business studies or enterprise or support learning within geography, modern studies, and probably quite a lot of other subjects as well. It does count towards your fair trade school status or your eco schools or right respecting schools awards. Um, and within the last couple of years, we have um, worked on the, the 90 kilo challenge materials. There are now lesson plans linked to climate change and how this is affecting the rice farmers in Malawi. Um, there are real challenges around rains. They used to know exactly when the rains would come, the short rains and the long rains, and they used to therefore be able to plant at a firm time and harvest at a firm time. That's no longer the case. They get a lot of drought, they get a lot of um, flooding. Last year, I think it was, um, quite a lot of the harvest was destroyed not long before harvest because of um, the, the winds and the plants were just ripped out of the ground. So I think understanding some of that with a very real life example is, is what the, the 90 kilo challenge is about. These, um, the lesson plans have been developed by friends at WASDEC, the West of Scotland Development Education Centre, so very much designed with the curriculum in, in mind. And I guess on the climate change ones, particularly relevant following COP26. Um, I think I do have a little bit longer, but I think that's all I actually wanted to say. I'd really encourage people to, um, to undertake the challenge. We've had the best part of a thousand schools and churches undertake the challenge because it does also work for, for church groups or for guide groups or other things. We have another pack that works in, in a church setting. Um, and I think, yeah, it, it is a really good versatile way of bringing fair trade to life with a very real example. So I'll stop there and hand back to Claire. Yep, thank you so much, Tracy. And to everybody, really, what a fantastic array of opportunities and activities to bring fair trade to life in schools, whether you've got your fair trade school uniform or your rice challenge or some of the fantastic resources um, that your local development education centres offer. And of course, there's always the opportunity to reach out to your local community group, as Mark and Catherine highlighted, um, because they're the one really special thing about the fair trade movement is that it's a grassroots campaign and there are campaigners all across the country um, who would be delighted to come and speak to the students in your school. So do utilise that. Um, so just before we finish, and I hope I won't be too long here, so hopefully we'll have five minutes to answer any questions you have. So do put any questions you have in the chat at the moment. Is that I work with the Fair Trade Schools team at the Fair Trade Foundation. I just wanted to highlight some of the resources that are available for you to go and teach about fair trade and climate in your school. And of course, there are lots of fantastic ones that the forum have. Both JTS and Cool Schools have them as well, so do, do have a look at them too. So here's our website address at the top here, schools.fairtrade.org.uk. Our email address is also really easy to remember because it's just schools at fairtrade.org.uk. So if you've got any questions, do contact us. So we've got a whole teaching resources library just where the arrow is pointing here. And if you click onto there, you'll find um, recordings of um, teacher training sessions, so such as this one, professional learning, um, activities and games for your students, assembly plans, and we've got lots of scripts in there, um, exploring fair trade through role play, so what better way than to get your class um, to put on a role play to the school um, to have student-led learning. We've got some audio books up there, lots and lots of films with follow-up lesson plans and activities. Um, we developed a whole range of home learning um, activity grids throughout the pandemic, which of course are fantastic for kind of termly home learning challenges, um, really interdisciplinary and um, topic-based learning that are quite resource-like, and of course lesson plans for all ages. And we've got resources available um, 
from age three, so really early at nursery stage, all the way up to secondary school on there. Um, so I just wanted to draw your attention to these packs here. We've got Climate, Fair Trade and New Education packs. We have these available for early years, primary and secondary schools. They're really comprehensive and they contain um, all of the resources you need to explore these issues in your classes, whether it's whole school assemblies or presentations and inputs to different lesson plans that kind of unpick some of the issues that we've presented to you today. Uh, there's quizzes, home learning, and then also the case studies and stories of farmers who are currently being affected um, drastically by the changing climate. Obviously, um, there's been, I've seen in the chat that some of these issues are really difficult to, to discuss with, especially younger learners. So we've developed lots of play-based activities um, for young learners that, um, again, are designed for nursery settings. Um, so do have a look at them. We have a lovely one that we've just um, launched this week called Where Does Coffee Come From? So you can meet Gaku the giraffe in Kenya to explore um, the origins of coffee and the people and places involved in its production. Um, also, Josh and Sally touched on a new film series that we launched called A Fair Future, which is a four part film and lesson series that comes with very comprehensive teaching notes. And um, this resource um, came out of, um, in October, we spoke to a farming cooperative in Kenya. Um, and this is all about exploring the inequality at the heart of the climate crisis, because it's those that are most affected that have done the least to cause the crisis. What it's like to farm in a climate crisis and Mika, um, who is a coffee farmer, will show the children some of the impacts of the changing weather on his farm. How fair trade then supports farmers in um, who are dealing with the effects of the climate crisis. And then finally, how to take action for a fair future. And I also saw in the chat that it is really difficult just now, it's really overwhelming for young people. And what this episode does is takes, addresses the fact that this is not your sole responsibility or the individual of one individual or a young person, but actually we're part of a, it introduces systems thinking that we're part of a wider web and that we all have a role to play, but some people have more responsibility than others and how businesses and governments and individuals can interact and influence their own sphere of influence to make big changes. And I think that's really shown by all of the wonderful participants and teachers that we have along today is that we're all um, wanting to make small changes to our way of life to ultimately make a bigger systems change. So I would go and have a look at that resource. It's available for ages seven to 14. And then the second thing that we offer is a free school award program. So you can find that in the tab next to teaching resources in school awards. And it's a three tiered award program that goes from just finding out where your learners are at in terms of understanding fair trade. So becoming fair aware to then taking action. So that's fair active. And then the highest level of fair trade award is fair achiever. And that's when you've really embedded those fair trade values across the life of the school. And the free award program provides that structure to support you to embed that and our team are here to help you with. So please do, do go and have a look and the team are, are here to support you with that. And as you say, lots of the inputs and activities that you've heard of today, the Rice Challenge, the Fair Trade School Uniform, you can use those as evidence to gain a school award and lots of you will be doing these things already. So it's a great way to gain recognition for your learning. So do join us in becoming a fair trade school. There's just shy of a thousand fair trade schools at the moment all across the country. Um, and now having had these inputs from, from the wonderful organizations we've heard of today, it would be great if you could go to the annotate button at the top of the screen. And having had the inputs, how confident do you feel now about the links between fair trade and climate change or exploring some of these issues in your class? So if you just go to annotate at the top and pick your shape and mark it on the line, I'll just give you about 30 seconds to go ahead and note that down. 
that's great. It's great so, to see so many people feeling confident about teaching these issues. And hopefully, if you have some time to go away and have a read and a look and a download at the resources, um, then it, it should move you a little bit bit along. But do take a note of our contact details. And if you have any questions, we are all here um, to support and help you bring these issues into the classroom and introduce them to young people. So I think I'm going to thank you very much, everyone, for annotating that. I'm going to stop there and see if we've got any questions in the chat in the last three minutes that we have. But I just want to reiterate a huge thank you to everybody coming along today. It's been wonderful to have so many people from across the country join us. Um, and if you have any questions, do pop them in or feel free to unmute as well. Now, I've seen a question earlier that um, gluten-free fair trade products, that maybe that's perhaps not many of them. Now, there are over 6,000 fair trade products available and that's expanding every day. I'm not personally sure about what gluten-free products are available. However, I will put the link to the Buying Fair Trade page, which has all of the, um, the products available now. And I'll definitely feed that back to our team about the the market for gluten-free fair trade products thank you very much i just checked on the tradecraft website actually and i thought there were biscuits but i can't see anything all i can see is dried fruit and nuts and stuff so maybe i imagined that sorry mm. And dairy free and vegan as well. And I think that this taps into, um, and you can share this with young people as well, that we have such power as a consumer. And I think even before the point that you vote, the pound in your pocket is worth so much and your voice as a consumer as well. So if you are seeing products that you're thinking, I, I want this product as fair trade, but it's not available, do shout out about it. Tell the retailers and you know the power of um kind of consumer demand really affects supply. And we've got a, a lesson plan that explores that with the, the children as well. Um, I realized, apologies, I didn't put the buying fair trade, the buying fair trade link is now in the chat there. Yeah, and it's fantastic to see so many of you have assemblies and lessons coming up and do get in touch if you need any support with them. That is half past five. So you are all free to go and get on with your day. Do join us at the Choose the World You Want Festival for lots more um, free events. I also appreciate that it can be that Zoom fatigue is very real. So if you don't fancy, you know, tuning in live, most of them will be recorded. Um, so do check back on the on demand section. The link is in the chat there. Um, we'll probably hang on just for an extra five, 10 minutes, if that's OK with everybody, just in case there's anybody that wants to ask any questions afterwards. So again, feel free to unmute or pop any questions in the chat. Thanks all. There, I've seen another question about Bala Sports Balls in the um, questions there. I think the situation, as I understand it, is that absolutely Tradecraft did take on that supply chain last autumn, um, but they're having a real issue getting balls from Pakistan. Um, one of the factories, I believe, has become non-certified, so they're having to find another factory that is certified to source the balls from. And I think their aim is to have um footballs back in stock by the autumn but there will be a delay is my is my understanding there may be people that have still got them shops that have still got them available at this point but not that i'm aware of
That's good to know, Tracy, because actually the Dundee Fair Trade Forum has been trying to buy Balaballs. Um, we had a donation and um, we were going to, to buy them and give them at a lower price to the schools, uh, or at least at the same price that they would buy other balls from. And we've been waiting for quite some time. Just to say, while we're waiting for the next question, in fairness to Bala Sports, and I'm sure Tracy will echo this, the supply chain issues are still quite acute in terms of bringing stuff to the UK from anywhere in the world at the moment, not least also the shipping costs. Um, just to give you all an idea, before COVID, a container of um, whatever coming out of India cost 2,000 US dollars. It now costs 12,000 US dollars. So. Um, you know, that's obviously adding to all of our price challenges. Um, and I'm sure Bala Sports... Absolutely. And, and getting a shipping container is quite a challenge. Yeah. Um, they're, uh, they're all in the wrong place post-COVID. And there seems to be a real issue with getting shipping containers to come from India or Africa to, the, to Europe. And then real issues in Rotterdam as, as people product transships there. So it is, it is seriously challenging. Absolutely. It's not something that's specific to ballast sport by any means. Right, thank you everyone. I think unless there's uh, any other questions, I think that's us wrapped up for the day. Um, so, thank you all and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Great session. Bye. Bye. Bye.